When you deal with a chess master, the only pieces that they ever want to play with is the classical 17th century wooden carved set. Why is that? I think back to one of the very first games I played on the Apple II, which was a game called Choplifter. And these were uh, monochromatic little pixel stick figures about 10 pixels high. And if you rescued them, they would get out and wave to you. And in some sense, those characters were so much more real to me than these incredibly high-res, beautifully rendered uh, Half-Life characters. Um, I think precisely because they were abstract. And the thing about 8-bit games is it's the game baby. It's the timing. It's the structure. You don't have any ability to distract the player with bright, shiny things and, and, and graphics. And so, in some ways, um, the 8-bit games are, are purer gameplay. So I've played World of Warcraft. I used to be a competitive Quake player. I've ran giant thousand-person guilds and other MMOs. I play iPhone games. But all of those experiences really do pale in comparison in terms of emotional effectiveness to the original feelings that I had playing MUDs. To some extent, those text-based environments went straight to my subconscious. Um, the reason why text MUDs were so powerful were because, because it's text, you don't have to filter images, you don't have to filter sound. It's going straight into your imagination and straight into where your heart lives. When I was playing Zaxxon or Pac-Man, I had to imagine a lot of things, all the way to sound effects. You just had this sequence of bouncing and crashing noises on the Atari. And so I would imagine my own sound effects, I would imagine better music, I would imagine better graphics, and I'd fill in all these gaps that the game wasn't able to do. But now you get to, you know, a modern day shooter and you look at something like Call of Duty or Halo and it's all there. There's no, there's no request for your imagination other than to immerse yourself in the character. I think that we're kind of at that point now, right, where we've got this photorealism and we're sort of there, we've sort of done it, and now a lot of us are looking back at things that we missed along the way and other uses for the medium besides photorealism. Every technological innovation, you know, that makes it possible to do amazing things that we couldn't do with the previous generations of machine also kind of, at first, makes the games less fun. The um, challenge with the technology is that you can always say, well, we'll make the same game or an elaboration of the genre with better graphics and more sound or in 3D or whatever. I mean, we used to sell games by demonstrating, oh, look, you know, it's the same game, but the graphics are better now. <laughs> and that alone was enough to sell the game. What that does, though, is move your kind of your focus of attention towards the display of the model. And we gotta remember that games, the model is not the display, the map is not the territory. For a game like God of War, graphics are incredibly important. It's, it's, God of War is, I mean, we're trying to basically take the same experience that you get from like the biggest production, Hollywood production, and uh, you know, the, that, that is a, a huge value to our game. The early games were basically two-dimensional games that I had taken, projecting the player into there. And we would have people play these little 2D games. You shoot the monsters, you pick up the goodies, you find the door to the next level, and they're fun in an abstract sort of way. But then you put the player in there in the first-person perspective, and they turn a corner and there's a monster right in their face. And early on, people were falling out of their chairs. Their hands would leap off of the controls and they would scream. And there would be all of this level of response that you just never saw before in any genre of video games. And that was the most powerful thing there. I remember um, one of the first times we got the weather system working in Far Cry 2. I've been driving around, uh, you know, through this you know, dusty savanna area and 
got in a little gunfight at some little shack and I went inside the shack to look for some health supplies and sort of toss the place. And when I turned to walk out, it had, this storm had come in and it was pouring, it, suddenly it was just pouring rain outside and I stopped my character, I stopped myself in the threshold of the doorway because I didn't want to get wet. Like that was like, oh, I'm, and I, there was this moment where I was like, I'm not gonna get wet, it's a, it's a video game. I, I want to tell a story, I want to show emotion, and the better the, so people always believe, oh, the better the graphics are going to look really good around here, but I'm also thinking of the graphics in terms of uh, facial expressions, and, you know, the lip is moving correct, the pores are, are, are working, um, you know, maybe there's a little sweat coming off them, or, or there's tears, or there's drool, or there's, you know, so I, I look at it as like, okay, now I can start to get the details better. We want to hook them sort of more on the reality, so the graphics mean better lighting, bounce lighting, better graphics, but they also mean a much more emotional experience to me. A lot of the pleasure of Far Cry, a lot of the fun of Far Cry 2 comes from the sense pleasure of the credibility of this place. And so that's something that wouldn't translate into, into an 8-bit Far Cry 2. So, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a balance, balancing act, I think. There are certain things we can simulate really well on the computer, but there are other things that our, our imagination can simulate much more effectively. And, you know, really it's a load balancing problem. We want to, you know, depending on what we're doing, figure out are we going to simulate this on the computer or on the player's imagination? And if we're going to simulate the imagination, what we have to do is leave, you know, blanks in the simulator so your imagination will naturally go in and fill those blanks. The representation, which is where we spend our technology, is a lie, right? The, the, the drawing, the display is a lie. And when we chase the graphics, we're spending all our energy on lying to users better rather than on innovating what the model is. And you can innovate the model with pen and paper. I don't think innovation and graphics have really anything to do with each other. And uh, I would argue that um, this, this notion that um, the design is the only thing that's important, if you the people that say that, I'm, I'm sure if they could have the best graphics in the world, they would as well. Technology has been in the world, and it doesn't have to be able to do it. It's not the same thing as the design, and 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 I think the future is, is really about uh, eliminating the, the necessity for imagination and replacing it with, with fidelity. And I don't think that's a bad thing because you can still read a book and people do. You know, I think we thought the books were going to go away. Uh, in our, our more panicky moments, but books are a perfect example of the, the absolute sort of blistering need for imagination to fill in the gaps and imagine the environments and, and feel the wind and, and all the stuff that's being described on the page. Um, so that's not going to go away, but there will be more options and, and uh, more experiences that completely eschew the need for any imagination and just are about experience, which in some ways is kind of exciting. Mm -hmm.